Immigration. It occurs worldwide in populations on every continent, cutting across political, cultural, and geographical boundaries. The causes are as varied as the populations and cultures involved. Famine, warfare, economics, politics, ethnic cleansing. The list of reasons is long. A huge part of this immigration story is how these movements of people impact and influence the places they move to. Over 200 years ago, in the 1760s, Germans looking for new and better opportunities for themselves and their families took advantage of an offer to immigrate to Russia. This wave of immigration set in motion a chain of events that would eventually have profound impact on Greeley and northern Colorado. I'm Tim Lynch. Welcome to another edition of Windows of Time. In each edition, we explore Greeley's past and look at the people and structures that helped write the pages of our history. In this edition, we will be exploring the history of the Germans from Russia, their emigration from Germany to Russia, their ensuing move from Russia to America, and finally, the move to northern Colorado. We will look at how these people combine thriftiness and an incredible work ethic to succeed in a society that was not always kind to them. We will examine aspects of their culture, education, religion, music, and some of their unique contributions and lasting legacies in the Greeley area. This story does not start with Germans from Russia immigrating to the United States. This unique group of people experienced two periods of immigration in their move to the U.S. The first being the move from Germany to Russia in the mid-18th century. In 1762 and 1763, Catherine the Great, Tsarina of Russia, issued manifestos recruiting Europeans, especially Germans, to come to the sparsely populated areas of Russia, including the Volga River region and Black Sea area. Potential immigrants were provided surprisingly generous rights within certain limits. The Tsarina's manifesto stated, we leave the management of internal affairs of the established separate colonies and settlements under the jurisdiction of the settlers. However, they are obligated to obey our civil law. Catherine the Great uh, offered considerably attractive incentives to draw colonists uh, to settle in the frontier regions, southeastern Russia along the Volga. And uh, in the Manifesto of July 1762, it was uh, freedom of religion and uh, land, uh, exemption from military service, uh, exemption for at least 30 years from taxation, and what later came to be called colonial self-government or settlement that would be under the authority of the local communities who traveled there rather than interference from Russian bureaucratic governmental authorities. This many wanted to hear. By 1850, drought, famine, and Russification programs, including military service requirements, led the Germans to leave their Russian colonies and immigrate to the United States. The Germans who were living in Russia left Russia to come to the United States for opportunity. They were running out of land living in Russia, uh, and they wanted to work. Uh, they lived under the Mir system in Russia, which means that land was passed from family member to family member. So each son in a family would get a certain tract of land, and they were just running out of land. And they wanted to work and they wanted to farm, so America represented an opportunity for them to get that land. Greeley resident Lydia Rule's grandfather, Adam Peter Aulis, born in the German colony of Walter in Russia, had served as a soldier in the Russian military. My mother's father, was conscripted into the Russian military at the end of the 19th century. Adam Peter Aulis served five years and then came back home. The Russians then said he had to go another five years and at that point that family said we're leaving and came to the United States in 1905. The journey to the United States was not easy. Lydia's mother described some of the difficulties faced upon their arrival at Ellis Island. My parents came uh, to this country in February, I don't know the exact day, 1905. They did, of course, 
land in New York at Ellis Island. My older sister had eye problems, glaucoma. My mother had to stay on the on Ellis Island for a whole month, and her eyes were treated. My sister's eyes She's were treated, and finally um, declared well enough to enter the United States. Clarence Kistler's parents, who emigrated from Russia to the United States in 1913, followed a path to Greeley common amongst Germans from Russia who ended up in the northern Colorado area. My parents came to the United States uh, in 1913. Uh, they left Russia, Frank, the little village or colony of Frank, Russia, in May of 1913. It took 15 days to come across the ocean on the ship named Kohn, K-O-L-N. Uh, when they first came to the United States, they uh, came into the port of Baltimore, Maryland, and then from the port of Baltimore, Maryland, took a train to Chicago, Illinois, and then from Chicago, they went to Grand Island, Nebraska, where my uh, uh, mother's brother lived. It was my mother's brother that sponsored my parents to come to the United States. Uh, my father did work in Grand Island on the railroad for a short time, basically unloading coal in coal cars, and then decided to come to Greeley, Colorado uh, to work in the sugar beet fields. Like the Kistlers, many originally congregated in Nebraska and Kansas, and then moved on to Colorado when the sugar beet industry recruited immigrant labor. Life was not easy once they arrived in Colorado. There was hard work and little rest. Dr. Ken Rock has conducted numerous oral history interviews with immigrants and their descendants. The stories that all families tell in the first decade of the 20th century in Colorado is essentially stoop labor in the beet fields. And here they went from, let's say, a relatively privileged, prosperous, um, peasant society that had considerable self-esteem and a consciousness of their own identity to a lower socioeconomic position where they were divided into uh, the beet farmers or the beet laborers I should say and the farmers those who had land they wanted their own land they found they had to work and so Entire families, men, women, and children, uh, worked from sunrise to sunset in the beet fields of Colorado uh, during that first decade. The Germans from Russia were known for being hard workers, did not concern themselves with the difficulty of the job. A life of labor, essentially stoop labor in the beet fields, often living in what were called beet shanties or beet shacks. Um, perceived by outsiders, shall we say, as a life in the dirt. Amelie Klein, a German from Russia, was interviewed in 1975 for a Colorado State University study project. She summed up the immigrants' attitude. Work is the best medicine for anybody. Work has never killed anybody, but idleness has. Typically, mothers in the family were responsible for running the household, including finances, food preparation, and child care. Not to mention they also worked in the fields. Germans from Russia were conscious of their own identity, acquiring their own land, and therefore a better life. All kinds of stories tell about them being conscious of their uh, inferior position in the wider English, Englisher society of the landlords and the farmers, but internally they were very conscious of their own identity and they were bound and determined they were not going to remain on the lowest rung of a socioeconomic ladder, but would acquire their own land and therefore a better life. Large families often lived in shanties or rental houses. Their strong work ethic and thriftiness enabled them to save money and purchase homes and farms. Families functioned as a single unit, and all resources went toward their land and property. 
Irene Houchins remembers how hard her family had to work after the death of her grandfather so that her grandmother could buy a house for them. Grandfather uh, did not like it. They were going to have to work the beets, and he decided he was going back to Russia because he didn't have to do that back there. He was a carpenter back there. So uh, that left, and in the flu of 1918, he died very suddenly. My grandmother had eight children and one on the way. So she took the family out, and they all worked the beets, and they worked very hard. When they were through working the beet fields, you know, for all the fall and uh, spring and everything, they had saved enough money that my grandmother was able to buy a house free and clear. During the winter, the girls uh, had jobs working at, quote, the beanery is what they called it. And it was a large kind of a warehouse on 13th Street and 6th Avenue. And they, uh, they sorted the beans. Local realtor W.E. Kinsala developed lots in East Greeley, just west of the Great Western Sugar Factory. Between the railroad tracks and First Avenue, he built small four-room houses, which he sold to Germans from Russia. The area now known as the Sunrise Park neighborhood became known as Little Russia, with its own business district and three churches. Lauren Brantner, who grew up east of Greeley, recalls the importance of recreating village life in their new country. This neighborhood was sort of a recreation of the kind of thing that would have been comfortable for them because they were used to living in a village and um, living with people with the, who shared their language and their culture and their religion and so on. Likewise, Irene Houchins remembers that the German-Russian community functioned like a completely independent city, and thus there were few reasons to leave the safe confines of the east side neighborhood. Probably the railroad tracks were the dividing line, and uh, living here, we had just about everything we needed. We had a grocery store, we had our church, we had the park, and we had our school. So there wasn't, except for some shopping and maybe going to a movie, there wasn't any reason to go any other place. Greeley resident Sandra Scott's grandfather, Conrad Borgens, built his own house near Sunrise Park using his knowledge of carpentry along with his own drawings and handmade tools. The quality of construction is reflected in the fact that Scott continues to reside in the house to this day. When my grandfather arrived in Greeley in about probably 1917, of course he rented and didn't want to rent wanted to build his family a home. That was very important to him. He had built a home previously in Lincoln, Nebraska. So he looked around the area, wanted to live on this side of town. This is where the Germans from Russia were, and this is where he felt comfortable. Found this lot here at 415 13th Street, and he drew out his plans. I have his plans here that he just drew out on brown kind of craft paper. I almost call it like sack paper. Uh, they're just in pencil, but uh, something for him to follow. My mom remembers standing here and watch it. Two horses pull, I don't know what type of equipment it is, but actually dig out the basement to the house. And then my grandfather and um, others would set the uh, frames to do the uh, foundation. The foundation for the basement is at least this thick, at least that thick. Um, he wanted it sturdy. I think he built it for Russian winters. So as soon as that was secure, the family moved in to the basement. Uh, six children, my, grand, my grandmother and grandfather, and uh, then my grandfather would go to work during the day as a carpenter, and then he would come home at night and on weekends and work on this house. Demands of working in the beet fields prevented some immigrant children from attending school regularly. However, those who could attend seemed to enjoy the experience. The Lincoln School, later known as the East Ward School, was built in 1915, as Germans from Russia were getting established in the area. Irene and Clarence remember their school experiences. My first grade teacher was Miss Basher, 
and we went on then to uh, second grade, I can't remember her name, third grade, my teacher was Irene Shirk, who was a very good teacher, who I liked very much. We went then to the big building for the upper grades. But I had wonderful, wonderful teachers. All the classes in school were taught in English. There were no German classes taught at the school. Uh, the teachers are all wonderful, and I do believe that probably uh, probably 80 or 90 percent of the student body were German-Russian youngsters. Irene and Clarence both recall that the May Fett celebration marked one of the most exciting Lincoln School annual events held in Eastside Park, now Sunrise Park. That was one of our big things of the year. We were all very excited about it, and we had it usually on May 1st. We had it at the park. Every class uh, had a dance. We had a king and a queen, and then we all had a picnic afterwards. Uh, they moved the piano over to the park, so we had music, and Miss Lucky was our, our music teacher. But uh, this was one of our big, big things for Lincoln School. Uh, one of the major activities was connected with a school, and that's when we had the Maypole celebration on May Day, where they put a big pole up on the, on the grass, and we had all these colorful ribbons, and we'd wander around and decorate the Maypool. Uh, I understand that they used to have a king and queen, but I was never the king, <laughs> and I wasn't even a part of that. I think I was too engrossed in getting my ribbon around the pole than I was in knowing about a king. Religion, like education, served a vital purpose. Lauren Bratner knows well the history of the neighborhood churches, which were staples of social and religious life. St. Paul's history indicates that it was, its first meeting was in a farmhouse northwest of Greeley at Wilhelm Brethauer's farm. And eventually in 1909, they ended up here in Greeley and did their, build, their first building. I think this is the third building for St. Paul's, according to its history. These two churches, this one and St. John's up the block, were very, very important to the Germans from Russia community. St. John's, in its history, says it was the third oldest evangelical Lutheran Volga German church in Colorado. Clarence Kissler remembers some of his early experiences at St. John Evangelical Church. We attended church every, every Sunday. Uh, the pastor was Reverend Schoenhauer. Uh, the church we attended was the St. John Evangelical Church, which you see in the background here. Uh, the church was founded here in Greeley in 1912. Uh, I was confirmed in this church and was baptized in this church. Uh, all of the uh, members of the congregation were German-Russian. Uh, the services in the early days were spoken only in German. And later on, they switched to part German and part English, and then eventually to English, and eventually the church was disbanded because a lot of the older people had gone on. The men sat on one side of the church, and the women sat on the other side of the church. Uh, the children usually had to sit in the front row so they could behave. Clarence remembers one particular church tradition rather fondly. At Christmas time, every child was given a brown sack with one orange in it and some nuts and some hard candy. And this was the highlight of the Christmas season. Besides being centers of social and spiritual life, the churches played another important role. Churches kept comprehensive records of baptisms and deaths, which typically served as the sole documentation of a person's life since birth certificates were rarely used in these communities. A rich musical tradition accompanied the immigrants to their new church communities in Greeley. Church bands with clarinet, bass horn, trumpet, and French horn were quite popular. Lauren Brantner has studied these musical traditions. The polka music that's played currently or in the last, say, 50, 60 years with the accordion in it, 
Um, that was a tradition that came along later. That instrument was not in Russia. Um, one component to German-Russian music that's not in other polka music is the hammered dulcimer. And we're sort of a unique culture in that that's part of our polka tradition. And if you, um, it's a very distinct sound. You will know if you've heard it once that that's a hammered dulcimer. We started to teach accordion. And I had four teachers busy. And we had done some guitar work. We had teaching guitar. And that turned out to be a great business. I liked it better than anything else I ever done. I started studying in Lesser's accordion studio when I was a child. My family drove 38 miles once a week to bring me here for lessons. Germans from Russia congregated in that music store. Not just the musicians, but just Germans from Russia. Everybody came in there to visit. And there was always some conversation going on in German and people laughing and Adolf would say, I'll translate it, but it's not as funny as if you heard it in German. And I didn't know German. My father wouldn't teach me German, so I missed out on all that funny stuff, I guess. Major world events starting with World War I ended the isolation that many Germans from Russia had enjoyed in their close-knit communities. On April 6, 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany, entering the conflict on the side of the Entente powers, including France, the United Kingdom, and Russia. German heritage in the United States thus became a bit more dangerous in 1917. Germans all over Weld County, including Germans from Russia, experienced discrimination, particularly during the war years. In January 1918, the German language was banned in schools and Sunday schools. Sarah Wolf, a German-Russian born in Denver, recalled, if you were caught talking German, you were in trouble. Because they arrived in Colorado um, in let's say sort of exotic East European costumes, uh, clothing, often women with head shawls, uh, sort of like babushkas, uh, they, Russian grandmothers, um, they were called Russians, or even in more derogatory fashion, Russians. And of course these people did not like this one bit. Though they faced pressures to assimilate, Germans from Russia, like other immigrant groups, never forgot who they were or where they came from. So there were lots of tales about um, misunderstanding. And to a rather large extent, the people grouped themselves together as sort of our people, unser Leit. It's a dialect phrase from the Volga German colonies, um, simply meaning our people. We know who we are. High German would say unsere Leute, our people. And this is not unique to this particular ethnic group. Many immigrants felt that way about themselves. Many parents tried to maintain German culture in the home, but these attempts remained mostly unsuccessful. Not all immigrants wished to hold on to the old ways. Eventually, the younger generation began to look at education and work differently from their parents. This increasing generational gap became ever more apparent during the 1930s and 40s as teens and young adults realized that education rather than hard physical labor would lead to greater success in America. The youth born in this country wanted to become American rather than simply hanging on to the ways of the older folks who talked funny. Their culture was kept behind the closed doors of the home and was only openly expressed when necessary. They found pride in being Americans and America was their first priority. Sandra Scott's grandfather, Conrad Borgens, also felt that since he was in America, he should become American. Conrad loved Russia, but upon immigrating to America, he made it his goal to integrate himself into the new society. Learning the language, taking classes, and ensuring that his children assimilated as well. 
My grandfather took his citizenship classes at East Ward School in Greeley, which is located on 11th Street at 5th Avenue. He would go in the evenings after he completed a full day of work. He would go to those classes and study various subjects. Uh, I know those included math, science, geography, social studies, English, of course. Um, and I, I believe those were the subjects that he had to be proficient in to then pass that and then become an American citizen and be actually naturalized. By 1939, another war began in Europe, again centering around Germany. The U.S. would not enter World War II until 1941, but anti-German sentiment in the country again reached fever pitch. Despite this, some Germans from Russia in the Greeley area put their knowledge of German language and culture to good use during the war. My parents wanted during the Second World War to connect with the German prisoner of war, the German prisoners out at the camp just west of Greeley. And so they took us out there uh, to visit the prisoners and uh, they would talk with them in German. I remember how uncomfortable it was for us because the germ at that point I was eight or nine years old. My brother and sister are two years younger, so they would have been four, six, and eight. And the Germans who saw us would often cry because we reminded them of their children that they couldn't see. And while our parents were talking, we didn't have a whole lot to do, and I remember once sitting on the steps and here came a German with a huge bull snake wrapped around his neck. And the bull snake was their pet. It frightened me. <laughs> My grandfather, of course, as I had stated when he came to the United States, wanted to assimilate into the culture and worked out and I believe probably picked up some English skills very quickly, although he did take English to become uh, an American citizen. So that was uh, a very unique skill actually because many folks came worked in the fields and and didn't learn English right away so my grandfather often often served as an interpreter many times they would come to my grandfather Conrad uh, and ask him to come perhaps they needed something done at their house and uh, they didn't know how to to speak to who was coming to do that in English so he would go and translate and make sure that they, they got a fair deal, so to speak. After World War II, the Sunrise Park neighborhood became more ethnically diverse. Increasing numbers of Hispanics began to populate the area around 13th Street. Sandra recalls the diversity in the Sunrise Park area. The east side of Greeley uh, was a melting pot. A lot of different uh, ethnic groups lived in this area, not only the Germans from Russia, which was predominant, but there were Hispanics, a uh, few African Americans, uh, several Irish. In fact, there was a lot of little uh, tiffs over in Sunrise Park between the Irish and the Germans. But, uh, and everyone was welcome here. All were welcome. My grandfather was very, he felt he was an immigrant. He came here, he came to a strange land. These people came to a strange town and everyone was welcome. Just over here on 4th, uh, uh, I believe 4th Avenue, there was a family, last name was Osborne, uh, George Osborne, uh, African American. He was always welcomed into the house. He was uh, asked to come in, to come in and sit in the kitchen, to have a cup of coffee. And I remember that was the first uh, African American or black man that I had ever seen. And I hid under the sink because I wasn't sure. And my mom got me out from under the sink and said, this is our friend George. And I shook his hand and we became very good friends. Germans from Russia have made significant contributions to Greeley, Weld County, Colorado, and the United States. Rammed earth home construction, cultural contributions such as Dutch hop polka, and on a more basic level, their hard work grew the local and regional economy. Their legacy has continued through the 20th and 21st centuries, from small business owners and farmers to teachers, attorneys, and entertainers. Germans from Russia have left their mark. The American Historical Society of Germans from Russia, formed in 1968 by David and Lydia Miller and others, seeks to disseminate historical information and ensure that these pieces of history are not forgotten. 
This organization is a hub of cultural activity, including connecting relatives in the U.S. with those still in Russia. The German-Russian Society, HSGR, does have a huge data bank now of connecting people uh, in Russia, and uh, many of them have gone and found relatives there. Germans from Russia clearly have a fascinating history in this part of the world. Their move to northern Colorado at the beginning of the 20th century continues to enrich us to this day. We hope you've enjoyed this installment of Windows of Time. Thanks for watching.